when you're saying um, you you were open and then you heard other people and then their their sounds and their emotions affected you, did it shut you down? Do you have anything in your past that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, it's not always the case. There's, that's why I'm asking. There's two yeah. versions of this. Mm -hmm. There's the version where you have had traumatic or you know, however you want to call that um, uh, memories in your past or, or experiences in your past that trigger you. And so um, when you are triggered, the something reminds you of the original situation, right? This can be anything from people who've been shot at in a war, so they hear a siren, or they hear a, 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 an engine backfire, to if you've been screamed at a lot, then maybe when you hear people scream, or you know, there's all kinds of things. Sometimes they're direct triggers, sometimes they're indirect triggers. Um, smells sometimes do to people, but there's lots of things that can trigger you. And so when you are triggered, your body uh, isn't capable of processing what's actually happening because there's a kind of a, um, an imprint or a, um, a mechanism in place already for that trigger that has been probably reinforced by things in the past. So when, in this case, you are wide open, you're somewhat relaxed and in, in your own process and then you 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 hear whatever causes the trigger, your body goes into, oh God, any moment now these horrible things are going to happen again. And so you are not present, of course, to what's actually happening. You are back in um, experiences of what has happened and what could happen again. That's different, I just want to say that because I can talk about both, from being what people call extremely sensitive or but isn't there now the HSP, right? That's what they call them, H, H, H highly sensitive person, sensitive person, which I, I want to say a few things about yeah, being a highly sensitive person myself. <laughs> well, or what about also I'm a recovering highly sensitive person. <laughs> yeah, empaths. I mean, empaths, and that's a, that's a, that, well, empaths can be both mm -hmm. or either. Right. So I'll talk about that too, but I'll stick with uh, you for a second and then I'll talk about the other things because it's, it's useful to make those distinctions. Yeah. So one of the ways that you have to kind of look at this, you don't have to, but you could look at this, is that, um, I don't know if you've ever seen these big, thick Japanese papers, you know, that, that are just handmade papers. If you take one of those, for instance, let's say, and you crumple it, um, you can wet it and completely iron it out again. It's completely smooth again. But if you put the slightest bit of pressure on the edges, it will crumple again exactly on the, on the first time it was crumpled. Mm -hmm. And that's how our nervous systems are in a certain way. Right? We, we develop stress, um, you know, folds and, and structures. And when everything's fine and cool and calm and, and optimal, then your paper is completely, um, you know, smooth. And then when stress appears, it goes right back into those creases. And that said, um, when you are massaging somebody and you are in an optimal state and you're not triggered, it doesn't access the flight or fight or freeze pathways. So you're capable of circulating that energy through you or, you know, uh, not taking it in. There's various strategies on how one can deal with, you know, that kind of stuff. But when you are in, when you're triggered, none of that applies. None of your carefully um, created and learned and, and tested skills works because you're in full on survival mode. Mm -hmm. And so the only thing you can do at that particular moment is do something to your body that counteracts the pattern that gets set in place. Right? So it sounded like your pattern was you, you got triggered, you tried to protect by pushing it away, which tensed you, um, you know, to the point where you got a migraine. And 
of course, one way to to not have that is leave the room mm -hmm. the moment it happens. Mm -hmm. right? So that would be an option, but it's not always useful. There is probably some of that. And then it is most likely not going to happen because you know what to anticipate and you can work against it because you, I'm assuming, have strategies. But if it happens upon you and you're in the middle of the trigger, the best you could possibly do is wiggle your toes, move your fingers, move your body, and then kind of inch out of there, do what you need to do, talk to yourself, you know, tell yourself you're safe, all of those things you have to do, and then you can probably re-enter. Right? And over time, it's of course useful to learn what to do when those triggers kick in and work with them, right? And expose yourself to a little bit of it, work with your body, relax your body, release some of the stuff somatically, and so on and so on. But um, that's, you're not the only one who you know, has to deal with that. And um, you can probably see it in other people easier than you can see it in yourself. You know? So that's number one. Number two, if you're an empath or if you're a highly sensitive person, talk about the empath first because you can become an empath because you had trauma where, and that happens a lot, right, where people just had to be constantly on the lookout, right? You have to constantly meter the response of the people around you and um, it's not, you know, you're not safe. So, so, so then you become empathic, but really you're just keeping yourself safe. But it has the effect that you can easily feel what other people sense, right? So that's one way that empaths come into the world. The other way sometimes is that people are just um, relaxed enough and have distinctions enough that they can really pick up a lot. Mm -hmm. right? Usually it's a combo of both, you know, people had stuff happen and maybe they worked with that or in addition they're also just gifted in the realms of feeling out. Because the thing is, things like clairvoyance or, uh, you know, empathy or, or stuff like that. Is this the earring there in the middle of the room? Sorry. Um, well, I'll tell you a little bit about that because that's one of my... Um, is that yours? So this is a classic example, right? So, so one of the things that I do, um, because I teach, right? But also I do it at home, I do it with my animals, my land. But one of the things that I do and know how to do is I can relax myself and spread out. And when, as I spread out, it's like literally like I traverse the land, so to speak. And I feel, in this case, when I teach, I fill the whole room with me, so to speak. So then everything that occurs in the room and everything that occurs in each person occurs in me because I'm everywhere, so to speak. So in that way, um, as, I'm, as my awareness spreads, you know, things that are not right or things that are happening or things like earrings or so are like a blip on the radar. Mm -hmm. And you can then choose to uh, ignore that blip or you can deal with that blip, right, depending on what it is. So that's a skill that can be learned. Everybody can learn that. Uh, some people are predisposed to it, some people are not, but you can practice the skill of feeling out, feeling into other people, feeling into animals, feeling into nature. Uh, I had it the other day, I was on the massage table and as I was on the massage table, I suddenly had this image of this whale, um, very strong, like, and I just opened my eyes and looked out and there was a whale. Uh, and it was exactly <laughs> where I had seen it in my mind's eye. And that's just a, that's just a, a function of spreading out, right? Mm. Anybody can do that. And people do it all the time. For instance, uh, with, with marine life, a good fishermen or so, they, they know where schools of fish are. How do they know? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it, you can learn distinctions. You can train your body. I once lost my pigs. That sounds very funny. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> my, my pigs were piglets. Um, that we, we had a workshop, and some and, and one of the assistants left the gate open unattended, which of course is a disaster in my house. And then we couldn't find the pigs, and I was, and you know, potbelly pigs are not exactly, and they weren't tame at that point. Um, you know, you lose potbelly pigs in somewhere. You know, you don't get it back, <laughs> most likely. Yeah, so. I, I, we looked everywhere, we couldn't find him, and eventually my last, after I had freaked out and, you know, <laughs> screamed at everybody and, <laughs> you know, lost my shit several times and ran down the, the, the roads twice and everything, <laughs> I went back home and I laid down. I finally remembered that I actually have skills, and I laid down. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, one, I'm like, oh, wait, why, not, why don't I do that? And I laid down, I laid on the ground, and I just spread out and I spread out and I spread out, and suddenly, there, I felt the blip of the two bodies. Oh and so then I went there, I was behind the horse trailer, in the bushes, against the fence, there was a cool spot where some wa there was a water leak, and that's where they were sleeping, completely oh. <laughs> unbothered. So you can, you can teach yourself that, and that would be considered empathy, I guess, or uh, mm -hmm. yeah, some people would call it whatever, sensitivity, some people call it clairvoyance. It's not clairvoyance, it's just every human being has those skills. That's how we made it into the 21st century. Mm -hmm. uh, and the absence of these skills is what's killing us, essentially, because we're no longer sensitive to our mm -hmm. environment. But I have friends, for instance, they uh, rehabilitate and rescue wolf dogs. Uh, they have a pack of 26 wolves and wolf dogs. Mm -hmm. And um, they can sense stuff and they are so sensitive to each other over long distances and mm -hmm. everything. We have that ability, mm -hmm. as is evidenced by anybody who's ever had a baby, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you'll, you'll know when your baby is hungry from hundreds of miles away. I mean, how the hell do you do that? Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right? You're like, oops. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's exactly how it is. And so, how do, is that possible? Well, we're that, we're that finely tuned. We just are not aware of that. So that's the empath. And, and you can, some people are naturally gifted, uh, but don't know what to do with it. And some people have acquired distinctions around these things. And these distinctions, it's a little bit like wine tasting. If you've ever, somebody ever tried to teach you how to, taste wine, right? You take a swig of wine, it's wine, it's good or bad. But then, you know, they go, okay, <coughs> suck it in over your palate and tell me, what wood can you taste, right? And you're like, and then, you're, and then you're like, oh, it's like cedar or something, right? And then it's like, swish it in the back of the tongue and, you know, what berry can your fruit can you taste? And you can actually learn how to taste wine and make those distinctions. But somebody has to teach you those distinctions. And it's doable and, and easy, essentially, to do. You have to just relax a bit, and the less you're in your head, the easier it is to acquire those, those information. <coughs> Highly sensitive people, on the other hand. Um, I'm, I'm not making fun of it, because I certainly um, consider myself highly sensitive. It is such that when you hug somebody, you essentially take in their, all their information, right? And then what you do with it is a, is a thing. And what I've come to learn, and Steve, who you haven't met, who, well, some of you have seen him in the, in, the, you know, in the dining hall with me, who is my teaching partner, has kind of disabused me of this notion quite heavily uh, by forcing me to take the subway when we would teach in <laughs> London and things of the heinous things of that nature. <laughs> <laughs> Clear first world problems because believe me, because of the clients I have, I have very, very, very high end clients. So I'm used to a driver picking me up and shit like that, right? Where I once made it from my house to a hotel in Miami without ever touching a door of anything. Because they opened the limousine, I got in, I was driven to the airport, somebody opened the door, took my luggage, took me through some back area into uh, some special check-in area, onto the plane, they picked me up from the plane, drove me to my luggage, into a limousine, <laughs> somebody opened the hotel door, somebody opened my room. I never touched a thing, right? So that's how I used to roll. And then I was suddenly in the London underground. Yeah. So... <laughs> 
having a highly yeah, sensitive yeah. person fit um, <laughs> of the highest order. And I think on one or, or two occasions almost had a panic attack because um, it's, it's definitely true that you can feel everything about everyone. And when you are that sensitive, things like flying or the subway are heinous. However, the thing that I've come to understand, and this is then the end of my long diatribe, um, is that when you become more and more and more and more narrow in your ability to be with people, you're actually devolving and not evolving. Mm -hmm. So that whole um, myth that you know highly spiritual people are highly sensitive people and you're so sensitive to people's energies, you can no longer be amongst regular people, uh, it becomes a bit dicey because um, if you can only be enlightened in a cave, you're not really enlightened, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. If you're no longer capable of being with humans, um, it's not only an issue for you, but it's also an issue, what's your motivation then? Right? Mm -hmm. If you know a little bit about Tantric Buddhism and all of that, they say the Bodhisattva purifies the land around him or her, mm -hmm. right? which is a way of saying, that you, you kind of purify the suffering around you because you're an open vessel where stuff just flows through you. Mm. As it flows through you, it, it gets blessed, so to speak, and to purify. Uh, I'm a far cry from that, mind you. But the um, ability and the fortitude to withstand other people's suffering and other people's right, and, uh, and stay with that is definitely also something that that can be cultivated. And so I don't think, um, uh, you know, kind of um, packing highly sensitive people into cotton is useful because it debilitates them more and more and more and more. The, the nervous system just gets less and less and less capable. And, you know, the nerves get more and more and more shredded. You need to medicate more and more and more with whatever your medication of choice is. So um, uh, I think when one considers oneself highly sensitive, it's good to acquire some actual skills to be with people and have compassion and learn loving kindness um, and, and a certain openness and a relaxation that allows one to be with people. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that if there isn't a trigger, you take good care of yourself. Right? You're always sensitive, but you can, with a bit of practice, decide if you want to spread yourself out and feel everything, or yeah. if you're going to hold your energy very close, close and close to a certain amount of stimulus. Yes. Which yeah. you can, of course. Right. I mean, of course, only to an extent, but uh, you can. And that's why I'm saying, um, by now, I have the ability to you know, widen it out or to pull it in. Grinberg, G-R-I-N-B-E-R-G. There's very few people in the States, yeah. uh, two or three, I think. You know. But in Europe, it's very common. And it's a somatic um, uh, modality where they actually work with the actual creases, so to speak, in your body and uh, teach you where the creases run and then how do you work with that particular pattern. Mm -hmm super effective. I wish Steve was here for this because he, he describes it so perfectly. I should, I should bring him in for this piece. So um, I'll, I'll paraphrase what he says and I'll add my own two cents to it. But so he always talks about the fact that when people go to a yoga class, right, they maybe discover that the hamstrings are tight. And now they diligently work on stretching the hamstrings, right? And so it becomes all about getting that handled. And um, you know, you stretch and you stretch, and if you don't uh, rip all, you know, open your lower back and, and injure your L5 because you're so intent on, you know, getting the hamstrings and all of that, uh, eventually you have tighter, you have longer hamstrings. But it really hasn't done anything to your mental state or your emotional state. But and then he says, you know, thank God yoga is an endless project. Now you can do headstands or you can do lotus or whatever, right? The, the thing is, 
So that's one way of saying it. And the, the, the thing to say is when you say, when is it enough self-development, or can I do self-development and uh, also work, if you do things so that your life gets better, if you do things so you feel better or more worthy or more whole, it's a never-ending process and it's never going to be enough. Mm -hmm. Because you are coming from a deficit. You're saying who I am isn't all right. And if I can just learn these things, then I will maybe be okay. And then I can rest and have a life and be happy and all of that. <laughs> Chances are pretty good that's never going to happen. And that's evidenced by lots and lots of people we know in the public eye who really have it all. But that's, of course, not enough, right? Because it's not about that. So. Any self-development that somehow tells you that if you just do another course or you just do this one more thing or you follow this guru or you go to this uh, whatever, you know, you walk over the coals and then you do the, you know, what, whatever it is, somehow it's go you're going to be enough and worthy and deserving and whatever else, you know, people say, is going, is, is keeping you on the hook because it's essentially preying on your sense of not being whole. So, however, learning new skills and increasing capacity and increasing capability is a worthwhile endeavor. You know? So, let's say you want to learn how to play the piano. Becoming a piano player is not going to make you a better human being. Right? It's just not. So if you go, if I'm a famous piano player, my life would be perfect. <laughs> um, you know, but, that, but that's the same as saying if I can just, whatever, mm -hmm. have a proper schedule and stick to it, or whatever you know, your self-development project du jour is. It is like saying if I learn the piano, then I will be a perfect human <laughs> being. Well, now you learn the piano, you spend a lot of time and energy on playing the piano and learning the piano and the best piano teachers and the best piano. Now have a you have a Steinway at home, you practice 16 hours a day, you know, you eat perfectly, your fingers are nimble, whatever. It does make you happy. However, you've acquired great skills and your great skills can probably give great joy and pleasure to other people as you play, but it doesn't make you happy. But it's nice to learn, have skills. So there's nothing wrong with you acquiring skills. But at the same time, you have to know that those skills are not going to fundamentally fix anything. So they're two different things. Is it great to do yoga? Absolutely. It's so good for your body. Is it going to change you in some you know, prescribed and uh, well-announced way? No. Because we have millions and millions of people doing yoga and they're still assholes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. I mean, if, yeah. you, if you don't need to do them, then don't do them. But if you feel like maybe it would be interesting to try something new, by all means, try it. Right? It's not a life or death decision, clearly. You know, when it becomes a life or death decision, then you're definitely not going to be lazy about it. Well, let's hope that's not going to happen. Well, let's, let's hope not, because then you don't have a choice, right? Yeah. If you and your children are on the verge of starvation, and you have to work in the fields, that's not what you wish for. Right? That's one of those do or die situations, where it might be, but like I said, let's not wish no. um, extreme circumstances mm -hmm. on you. If that's the only thing that's going to get you off your ass, you better find different motivations, or you're potentially bringing heavy stuff on yourself. Mm -hmm. So, um, what's the food you really like? Okay, so um, would you like some chocolate? Okay. All right, well, I need you to eat at least one whole bar. And then I need you to eat another bar. And so how am I going to get you to eat another bar and then another bar? Whatever yeah, your man can eat is however much he can eat. He can't force more pleasure down his throat, so to speak, than he can eat. <laughs> so if, I give, if you want half a bar of chocolate and I'm insisting 
that I think you should have a bar of chocolate, <laughs> we're going to have an issue, right? And then if I go, but you know what? It's really good chocolate, and <laughs> you, 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 you really should eat it, because I need you to eat my chocolate. <laughs> because I eat that much chocolate, and you just gave me that much chocolate, and I want more chocolate, but I'm, I first need you to eat that chocolate. <laughs> and then you come to me and you go, how do I get him to eat more chocolate? How do I get him to accept more chocolate? His unwillingness to eat that chocolate is, is just like, you know, he's avoiding me. Like, that's what this is. You have, to, you have to understand that whatever he's willing to take or is able to take is as much as you can give him. And over time, maybe he'll like more chocolate, but some days he might be more into chocolate than other days. Some days he might not want any chocolate. You know? So, so your standards of how much somebody should take are not their standards, particularly sexually. And it doesn't have so much to do with power as it has to do with capacity. So it's once again a nervous system thing, right? For whatever reason, this is not conscious, he can only take that much pleasure from you, right? For whatever reason. Could be that he doesn't want to surrender. Could be that he can't surrender. Could be that this is his, at this moment, capacity to open this. You can't pry some wedge in there and start beating with the hammer to open that wedge, right? That's rape, you know, so to speak. So what you want to do is you want to feel, you know, that you are all the chocolate in the world and then off yourself, of the abundance that you are, you give him exactly as much as is good for him, okay. as he can handle, so that he feels nourished. And then he can relax, mm -hmm. and then he'll open some more, and then he can take a little bit more in, and so on and so on. Eventually he'll realize that, that um, Letting you pleasure him doesn't mean an obligation or that you own him or things of that nature. And his nervous system can relax some more and he can trust you and he will feel that it's not some ulterior motive. But as long as he feels that you have to impose your standards on him, you know, two bars of chocolates is what you're going to eat and if it kills you, because that's what I want you to have, you know, then he'll be more capable of opening to you. Because too much of a good thing is still too much, yeah. right? And, and so, uh, on the other end, you have to just start learning boundary setting early on. You have to just go, look, this is as much as I can handle. It's not that I don't love you, it's not that I don't want to be with you. We have come to the end of my capacity. I do need space. Well, where his output goes is none of your issue, mm. right? It just can't go towards you if you don't have it. And that's the issue with relationships and with gifts, so to speak. It's not a gift if it, if it can't be taken, mm. right? That's you masturbating yourself, so to speak, with your idea of what's a great thing. You know? And so where he puts his energy is really none of your business. Your business is to, to maintain a boundary so that you're not being transgressed upon. Now, it's much easier to see that when somebody's nasty to you, uh, when somebody's so loving to you and so sexual, and you know, everybody says to your guy, why the fuck are you, you know, not getting, you know, whatever, a blowjob three times a day, and he goes, I fucking can't! <laughs> yeah? So, so the, that's not, that it builds massive resentment if you let other people give to you when you're not, when you're not in the process, in the, in the yeah, capability or capacity to receive. Yeah. Right? It just mm. piles up and, and, you know. So it's only a relationship and it's only a proper exchange when two people are sensitive to what's actually needed mm. and wanted versus, you know, self-gratification through service or self-gratification through sex or self-gratification through um, 
martyrdom. Mm. But I mean, you know, anybody who's ever heard, you know, I've given up my whole life to serve you. Uh, <laughs> it's like, well, did I want that? No. Yeah. Did I take it because it was easier to take it than to back you off every fucking day? Yes. And now I'm at fault, right? That's the classic scenario when you deal with a martyr. It's a total mind fuck. And, and that's where one has to have good conversations and just say, look, you know, it doesn't matter that it's well-meaning. It, I can't receive it. Through no fault of yours, perhaps, or maybe, you know, like I said, there's, there's some agenda involved often. Um, if you feel that you're only worthy if you give a lot, um, you know, you don't have much of a choice in the giving. You just got to give. And some people feel that they can't stop the receiving because it makes them bad or wrong or how could you, you know. And, but those are some very sensitive issues because every time you get transgressed upon and every time you transgress, you are, um, you're ruining the relationship mm -hmm. right? because these things come back to haunt. I can only tell you how I do it because I think that's a very individual thing. The differentiation or the, or the distinction that I had to learn for myself is, um, you're a therapist as well, right? Yeah. Because that's how it started with me, right? I would do eight hours, eight sessions a day, five days a week. I did that for 22 years, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and so, you know, you start feeling people as they are about to buzz in, right? I, I got so good that I had had my hand on the phone because I knew somebody was going to buzz in within 20 seconds or so, right? You get so in tune with those people. They come up the elevator and you're like, oh, shit. You know, you can already tell what it is. So how I measure it in both in workshops and in tr travel and in my personal life is how, how is my energy? How much uh, um, resource do I have? Mm -hmm. And how much am I, this brings us back to what you guys all were saying, you know, how much am I willing to receive or give? And then based on that, I have to make some calls. And the call these days, because I'm traveling year round, is energy levels. I no longer uh, cannibalize myself for the sake of the interaction. Right? Mm -hmm. So. What, what I do often is somebody will contact me or, or when, if it's at home and it's personal people, they'll come up and they'll go, do you have a moment? And then I have to feel how my body reacts to that. And then based on that, I make a decision on what I can do. And, and I've gotten quite good at very quickly going, do I have it, you know, ha do I have enough? And if I do have enough, then I'll engage. And if I don't have enough, then I'll have to say, look, I can't right now. So that, that's probably the most reliable way that you do it. But that said, as you know well, professionally speaking, there's people who live off other people's energy, mm -hmm. right? There's, a, there's certain personality disorders and other conditions of the psychic or psychological nature that make it that people feed off you. And mm -hmm. that always needs to be cut out. Uh, that's, mm -hmm. not an, that's, not an, that's not negotiable. That's you know, that's a deal breaker, yeah. yeah. So it, it's okay when somebody needs something, but it's not okay when somebody feeds off you. In a 22-year-old, um, you just have to slowly wean them off, right? make them self-sufficient, put in place things so that they can take care of themselves, empower them to take care of themselves, and then slowly cut the blood supply. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, of course you still love them and they're still yeah. your child and all yeah. of that, but every, every parent has to do that at some point yeah. because yeah. nobody wants to leave the house. Yeah. Shit, you know, I mean, I was just home with my parents and my mother made me breakfast and I could stay in bed as long as I wanted. It was pretty damn good, you know. <laughs> now, that, that flies for about three days at my parents' house. So I, then, then I have to grow up again, um, so to speak. And that's what you do. And it's not like you don't give them support and love and help, but they have to be independent. You know? yeah. 22 is a good age. Mm -hmm. 
kick somebody out of the nest. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but yes, you can tell and you know when somebody feeds off you. But it's always a matter of you or them. Right. Right. And preservation of your well being and your energy is ultimately more important. It's not a service if you you know, if you have to. The only person or the only people to whom you would give your life probably is your children. Because that's what one does as a mother, right? If it's like a matter of them eating or you eating, you're going to feed your children, but yeah. but your clients are not your children. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, first order of business, stop talking about it and stop making the moves. Because for a moment, just for a moment, because if a guy is actually a a guy, a proper man, with uh, some freedom and some, you know, um, sense of himself, and he's not just out to please a woman because he still has little boy issues, mm -hmm. uh, and he and he needs to just, you know, make it so that mommy is happy in some way or another. He can't actually have sex with you when you're kind of demanding sex, as much as he would like to, because. You're telling him what to do, and when he does it, it sets up a dynamic where he's losing his freedom. Mm -hmm. So a lot of men who are not in the little boy dynamic, when even the slightest whiff of an obligation comes their way, they just don't feel it anymore. And it's not rational. He's not going, I'm not going to give her what she wants. It's just their body kind of goes, ah, you know. And so you don't want to have that happen, right? You don't want to have that happen. Instead, what I would suggest you do is find actual pleasure. So instead of coming on to him, one of the things that is a much better idea is um, displaying pleasure, right? So he's tired, so he's in bed, so you start touching yourself, making some sounds, enjoying yourself. I don't think he's going to fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> he's not going to have to go into this place of, okay, I'm tired, but she really wants it, and if I reject her now, then I'll be held to pay later, but <laughs> shit, I can't just give her sex because she wants it to. And it's not totally conscious, right? But right. this thing starts happening where he has to sell him out or he has to sell the relationship out. And that's a paralyzing place, and I've heard this often from men that they just, they just go away, mm -hmm. and they just fall asleep mm -hmm. in some way or another. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest, it's not that you can't make the moves, but I wouldn't make the moves as in uh, creating a demand or an obligation. I'd make the moves by actually displaying actual pleasure. So if you have a higher sex drive, openly display that by having pleasure in your body with yourself and watch what happens. <laughs> Once again, it, it becomes a bit tricky, right? Because you tell him that you want it, then when he does it, then you're all fucked off about it, right? Um, so that's like, we, you know, it's like bad dog training, right? It's like when you have a puppy, and the pup, puppy, and you call the puppy, and the puppy doesn't come immediately, and when it comes, you beat it. Um, you gotta have, you know, you gotta have a head shy puppy, and, and it's not different with a man, so. Um, to the, it, it, it isn't, right? I mean, humans are not that much more complicated than, well, I think dogs are saints, personally, right? Uh, I, I think dogs are superior to many creatures on this planet. But, so, when I say dog training, that's actually a compliment, right? But, but you have to kind of um, keep in mind, in the middle of your trigger, that if you give uh, even intermittent negative reward to a positive action, it's going to really make things way worse. Right? You just say to him, okay, so I've gotten some, into some bad habit of getting all triggered at points. Um, I'm going to just say some code word and we're going to proceed, right? As if nothing's happened, even though I'm all fucked up. Um, not to the point where you violate yourself, but to the point where you interrupt the pattern. So come up with some really stupid code words, something that makes both of you laugh, ideally something slightly obscene, um, 
and then just say that word and then you both laugh and then proceed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the, that's the easiest uh, mm -hmm. way out of that. Mm -hmm. uh, There's an inherent issue that uh, can't be remedied, which is that when a woman tells a man what to do, in a se particular in a sexual way, it never ends well. Yeah. Because best case scenario, he does what you tell him, which is not exactly what you want anyway. It's never right. right. It's never. You know. <laughs> I mean, even if you could make a diagram and point to things, and and, yeah. and which is you know what a lot of. <laughs> What a lot of Tantra, uh, uh, you know, tries to do is like the healing conversations and the healing, and you teach the guy exactly how to touch and where to touch, and he does all the right things, and then he does it, and it's like, I need bread. You know? <laughs> oh, shit, I forgot the eggs, right? It's just like, it's not it. The, the best it can do is scratch the itch ever so slightly, but it's ever not so it, right? <laughs> so... So inherently, a woman can't teach a guy these things. Um, if you start teaching him, you, he's no longer your man, right? He's your mm -hmm. student. Mm -hmm. And um, if you do teach him well, he's still, it's still not going to scratch the itch, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's not what you want is the spontaneous uh, expression of something that's much deeper than technique. Yeah. You know? And uh, it's nice to have skill, you know, it's nice when a man has skill for sure, but skill doesn't make up for um, kind of a deeper thing that, that mm -hmm. the body and the mind and the soul responds to. That said, there's no saying that you would get it somewhere else. That's and, and what I mean by that is, even if you find somebody with whom you have hot sex, chances are pretty good that down the line the same stuff will creep in because that's what happens. So because you choose based on a certain uh, predicament, and so you will find that the same things happen with different people. Mm -hmm. And you know, you pick a guy who is nothing like your husband. Let's say if you would go and he's nothing like your husband and you have amazing sex and it's great and then one fine day right you know like oh shit and that's that's just the way it goes now that's not to say that certain situations don't call for that but and that that, that it wouldn't be you know um i don't know I wouldn't say it's not worth exploring other options if it's really one of those things where you go, if I don't have this before I die, my life is wasted or something like that, right? Um, I would certainly never, never discourage anybody who feels that way to not explore the thing that they're that passionate about. But outside of that consideration, essentially no human can give you the experience that you yearn for really. That's not to say that one cannot have incredibly hot sex and, mm -hmm. and you know, that that shouldn't be a thing. But long term, um, the, the thing that makes it so good is a certain, uh, I'm going to say it, but, but, you know, this is to be taken very lightly, particularly for those of you who are Catholic. Um, <laughs> right? It's like what you want is God sex. Right? You want to somehow be taken someplace where you can go by yourself and where you can't instruct somebody to take you, where you somehow get obliterated into, you know, into something that's way beyond what humans do in a certain way. And most of us have had a moment of that at some point, or at least we have that feeling in our body, and that's kind of what we are after. Mm -hmm. And the only way to get that is is actually when you have sex with God. So that's what I'm saying, please, you know, do not quote me on this. And what I mean by that is to find um, the disposition or the orientation towards whatever you call God, right? That, that thing that does that thing to you, where you get obliterated by it, you know, God, the universe, Shiva, whatever you want to call it. And when you can find that orientation, you can also find that in your man. 
and then pretty much anything he does can be that because you have a different orientation towards the whole thing and it's not a I'm not getting what I want but a I'm giving everything there's to be given because what else is there to do but that takes some time and it takes some practice and it's usually best done by yourself where you develop some kind of a sexual relationship with yourself and God, so to speak, that's independent of your husband. And that kind of draws onto somewhat of a rich, in, where you create kind of a rich inner life of a, of a kind of a heart open devotional sexual nature where you can feel that press, right, that, that heavy, heavy press of consciousness or God or whatever you want to call it entering you or, or, or filling you and then you can pretty much have that when you have sex with a human right? because you can orient that way so that would be my best offer towards you getting that thing that you want you know, which is um, I mean yeah, what else matters, right, on one end. And then of the on the other end there's lots of other things that matter, right? So yeah. it's yeah. it's a it's a it's a difficult thing um to to straddle because no one should go unfulfilled and the things that we think fulfill us usually never do. So yeah. And we can, you know, privately speak about what are some of those practices um that you can do. But it's mostly a an attitude of opening to, you know, the, the entirety or totality of the penetration that's everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's readily available everywhere. Mm -hmm. If you allow yourself to be, so to speak, fucked by God as you walk around. <laughs> and when that happens, it's very, very ecstatic. But right? that's what you read when you read Rumi and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. you know? Rumi clearly got fucked by God and Shams, but that's a different story, you know. But but and and Shams Tabri, which is uh, you know the, the beloved that he speaks about, um, and was killed for it. Right? Rumi was killed by Shams' uh, son, I think. Uh, so, um, but but that beloved is 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 God, but but adored in the form of another human. Uh, No, these things can't be written about. I mean, in in my particular lineage, there is a practice of deity yoga um, that uh, that alludes to that or or instructs on that. But um, you know, these things can't really be written about. You have to actually do them and feel them, and and it, it, these are yeah, it, it, it's can't write a manual on how to fuck God. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should. <laughs> I can just see how that, how well that's gonna go down. Yes. <laughs> Simon and Schuster, how to fuck God, a manual. <laughs> it is useless. But it's mostly useless because it's a transmission, right? And not an instruction. In, in the in the in the in the, in the true sense, it's a transmission, not an instruction, mm -hmm. and so uh, hence it can't really be written about. And thankfully, it can't be stolen either, you know, because it's a it, it, it's a it's it's very intangible in a certain way. But it's very palpable when you have it. Yeah, yeah. it does require a um, uh, a very distinct um, level of relaxation or surrender, though. Mm -hmm. because you can't I'm going to say this very grossly so that you really get this God has a very large cock mm -hmm. you must be relaxed mm -hmm. you know? Amen. So, <laughs> you can't be tight right? tight and unlubricated doesn't work for God so. <laughs>